Well, hello and good evening to everybody. I'd like to welcome members of AIA Victoria, uh, members of other AIA branches around the country, and all other guests joining us. My name is Alastair Roth. I'm the executive director at AIA Victoria, and we really appreciate your interest and logging on to our webinar here. Uh, as usual, just a few words on the running order. We'll take questions in the second half. If uh, you're not yet used to Zoom, you can type questions in the Q&A tab in the toolbar at the, the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can vote on uh, questions posed by other people and we'll send a link to a recording after this. So to today's webinar, you'll, you'll be aware, of course, that Brexit negotiations between the UK and the EU are continuing but with a heavy focus at the moment on trade policy and the market access relationship. There are some items though that are not up for discussion. So to tell us why the UK has dropped foreign policy from its Brexit negotiations, we're joined from deepest rural Kent by Professor Richard Whitman. Richman, Richard is uh, Director of the Global Europe Centre and Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent. He's a widely published author and he's also an Associate Fellow at Chatham House. In fact, it was his recent expert comment for Chatham House on this topic that prompted us to, to track him down and invite him to come and talk to us again. And we thought it was appropriate too in the month that Chatham House is marking its centenary, and congratulations to them on that, that we could host Richard. That centenary, of course, laid the foundation for our own institute 95 years ago as an overseas branch as we started out of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. So Richard, good morning. I'm just gonna make morning. sure that we've actually got video of you and you're connected. Good morning. Okay, thank you very much well, for good, joining good us. Good afternoon, I should yeah. say. Yeah, well, that's good morning to you. Um, anyway, the, the virtual floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I'm going to use uh, slides and I hope that's not too distracting for those of you who are watching, but one of the things that, um, that we've learned over the last little while with uh, this, uh, this lockdown uh, situation is that uh, occasionally the sound will drop out. And, and so a few more words on the slide maybe uh, helps to, to bridge some of the gaps. So thanks, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the opportunity to join you, which I know in, in sort of difficult uh, circumstances. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I hope that uh, things will return to normal for, for you before too long. Um, uh, it's great to have a chance to, uh, to talk about this topic because it's, uh, uh, as uh, as we've just heard, it's pretty live, uh, and uh, it's something that we're actively discussing here in the UK. Uh, and I was giving evidence to a to a parliamentary committee yesterday, uh, where they were kind of scratching their heads and trying to understand what the way forward might be uh, on this on this issue. So what I want to do, if I may, is first of all just to uh, remind uh, people you know, what the setup is for the EU in terms of foreign security and defense policy. So I'll do that uh, fairly swiftly so we can understand sort of what the UK is left and, and what the UK could or may not be connected to uh, in, in the future. But then I'll, I'll spend more time talking about the five reasons why the UK has stepped away from uh, its uh, or potential foreign policy relationship with uh, the EU, uh, and uh, and towards the end of that, you know, reach a point in which we'll uh, assess whether that's going to come back into the negotiations uh, at some point. So, I've got I've got sort of five uh, five bits of uh, bits of evidence, if you like. Um, first of all, that you know the UK has been fairly sceptical about EU foreign policy cooperation anyway, but that's fed into a changed dynamic since we had the general election back here um, at the end of end of last year. Uh, and then uh, the fact the UK has already left the EU's foreign policy uh, system with a bit of caveating uh, on that. And then how the UK has sought to change the terms of the negotiation before I think we need to think about it in a wider, uh, wider context. So 
Uh, I hope that um, my argument will be, will be clear. If not, obviously we can pick up uh, on, uh, on the points in the presentation, anything else uh, in the Q&A uh, after, so thank you. Um, Henry Kissinger, uh, when, uh, when he was uh, uh, in office, uh, sort of posed the question, you know, who do I call in Europe if I want to talk about foreign policy? And the European Union has spent the period since the early 1970s trying to answer that question uh, and trying to put in place arrangements to uh, offer uh, a collective approach to foreign policy, uh, particularly as outsiders have had more and more expectation of the EU doing foreign policy uh, alongside uh, its uh, economic uh, integration uh, process. Uh, and, and they've ended up doing this in a fairly, uh, fairly strange kind of way because you know, foreign policy cooperation on the part of the EU uh, is an intergovernmental undertaking, meaning that uh, member states, although they have a, a treaty obligation uh, to engage in foreign policy cooperation with one another, they're not trying to construct a single foreign policy. They're trying to identify areas where they have foreign policy interests in common uh, and to pursue those uh, collectively with some, some arrangements they've put in place uh, much more recently. So this is uh, an area unlike, for example, uh, economic integration, where the rules are much more binding. You have a role for the European Court of Justice. Uh, member states have given up sovereignty. Here, uh, it's more of a quasi-voluntary uh, undertaking, but a, a, a binding uh, uh, undertaking in the sense that there's a treaty obligation under the Treaty on European Union to, um, to cooperate with one another on foreign policy making. And what they've done across time uh, is, is what I call a kind of Lego approach to foreign policy uh, making. For those of you familiar with Lego and its you know, coloured bricks, essentially what they've done is to build up little blocks of foreign policy uh, in different areas in the hope of sort of building up uh, a, a broader uh, and greater volume of collective foreign policy. And so the EU member states collectively uh, have uh, pretty much foreign policy position on anything that you care to think about. But the issue really across time has been how you can be effective uh, as a group of now 27 countries in your foreign policy, as I say, in a, in a setting in which um, you, you share foreign policy making uh, with the EU. Uh, and, uh, and the big changes uh, over the last decade and a half have been to sort of institutionalize that cooperation uh, through uh, the Foreign Affairs Council, which is where foreign ministers meet, uh, and something that sits under that, which is the Political and Security Committee. Uh, and that body is the sort of day-to-day -day running uh, of European foreign policy, where differences are thrashed out through working groups and and uh, uh, communications infrastructure between uh, member state foreign ministries. Uh, and they've sought to, in a way, uh, answer uh, Mr. Kissinger's question by creating this role uh, of uh, High Representative Vice President of the Commission for Foreign Policy, uh, which was, uh, first job was taken by Kathy Ashton, uh, and uh, more recently, uh, is taken by Mr. Morel, uh, who's a former uh, Spanish uh, minister. And that's given some kind of visibility uh, to European uh, foreign policy, as has the creation of a dedicated EU diplomatic service, the External Action Service. Uh, and what they've tried to do across time, the EU's tried to do across time, particularly using things like sanctions, you know, the economic strength uh, of the union, uh, is to, to look at ways in which they can enhance, enhance the implementation uh, of foreign policy collectively. But most of that is done through, um, through the member states. So we have a sort of process of what we can call uploading and downloading. You know, member states upload their foreign policy interests, try and get other member states to be interested uh, and, uh, and download their foreign policy from the EU. Perhaps you can start to see maybe where, you know, the, the UK sort of fitted into uh, this story as a large member state with uh, significant diplomatic uh, and other foreign policy infrastructure that the EU has lost, um, you know, a significant state from that structure. Um, but the UK has obviously lost access uh, to this system uh, also since the end of January. But there's another uh, dimension uh, of this. It's also worth flagging up that alongside the common foreign security policy, 
particularly since uh, the, the turn of the century, the EU's got more serious in something that calls a security and defense policy, uh, common security and defense policy. Uh, and uh, that was a bit of a taboo uh, when it was first, uh, first got underway in that uh, the EU treaties hadn't been about defense in the past and the defense for Europeans had been NATO. Um, but what they've done subsequently is to, to look for uh, uh, which is uh, non-conflictual with the work that's done through NATO, but, but sort of carves out a niche for the EU. So there's been a big focus on conflict management, uh, uh, conflict uh, prevention, uh, and conflict mitigation. And a key part of that has been civilian and military missions to, to uh, third countries, um, uh, particularly um, in, um, in the Great Lakes region, uh, now in Sahal, in the Western Balkans, uh, and uh, around uh, the rim uh, of Russia. Um, and uh, those are fairly small scale, um, but um, they have increased, uh, in effect, um, put an obligation on member states to uh, come to the, the assistance uh, of one another um, in, uh, in security, uh, the security sphere and institutional arrangements to make that possible. But here, you know, the real rub for the EU uh, is you've got a group uh, of very disparate states, you know, that range from small uh, micro states, some uh, states which have a, a, a posture of neutrality, some of which are NATO member states. And in the background, the United States has had real concerns about whether all of this leads to duplication with what's going on within NATO, discrimination against non uh, Non-EU uh, members who are in Europe, like Turkey, Norway, Iceland, and now the UK, of course, and whether developing this defence idea leads to a decoupling between the, uh, uh, the EU uh, and uh, and the US. Again, think about the UK and the UK departing from that. There are costs uh, for uh, for the EU that I'll come back to. So, a quick snapshot of where these uh, missions uh, are taking place for those who may. Uh, be un, uh, unfamiliar with them. You can see that they're, for the most part, uh, in the EU's neighbourhood uh, or uh, in, uh, in the wider uh, neighbourhood. So the UK, um, and uh, obviously uh, the UK was a part of that system, but for many commentators, um, uh, and this is my first observation about why the UK uh, has uh, sort of moved away uh, from foreign policy within the Brexit negotiations, is that the UK always had a, a rather skeptical approach to this foreign security and defense policy cooperation uh, anyway. It felt reasonably comfortable with the fact that it wasn't um, operating on the same basis uh, as, as market or economic integration cooperation, being treaty-based uh, treaty uh, and so on. And, and the UK tended to have more of a, pref a preference for what we call Brusselsization, which is basically doing intergovernmentalism uh, in, in Brussels, very skeptical about writing more and more stuff into, into the treaties, and a real preference for, for doing things uh, that worked. In other words, being less enthusiastic about combined or common foreign security policy for theological reasons, for pushing forward European integration and really wanting it to have practical benefits and effects for, for European security. So the UK um, uh, shared the US anxieties, those three Ds, decoupling, duplication, and discrimination on defense, but also I think had a strong preference for uh, what I call the three Cs, which is to make sure that whatever the EU did in foreign security policy was complementary with NATO, that if the EU was gonna do stuff, particularly in the security and defense policy area, um, it was where it might have a competitive advantage, things like civilian crisis management, for example, and really interested in boosting countries, perhaps countries which were not members of NATO, into, into building their capabilities. So the UK pushed the idea of battle groups um, for EU member states to come together to, to basically ha have more uh, flexible and available forces available by individually uh, or collectively but also quite keen on the idea of coalitions of the willing and able when you could do things. I'm very strong, strongly opposed to what is a bit of a theme in, in European security policy, which is uh, presentism. You know, everybody wants to be part uh, of the action, but not necessarily 
um, uh, heavy lifting, if I if I could put it that way. So, you know, the first uh, observation of, is is about where, you know whether foreign policy is still in the negotiations or isn't in the negotiations, is because the UK's starting point was was a bit of an inbuilt skepticism about this process uh, uh, anyway. But obviously, the the uh, uh, the thing that we've lived through here in the UK since 2016 has been the Brexit process. You know, following through on that referendum result. Uh, and really what's changed uh, the terms of discussion in the UK and uh, really I think is most important in facilitating this change of mind on foreign policy cooperation uh, is the general election, Boris Johnson winning the general election at the end of last year, winning with a very large majority. You've got to go back to Margaret Thatcher's administration to find a Conservative Prime Minister enjoying such a large uh, majority uh, and elected on the slogan of, of getting Brexit done. Uh, and and that was done uh, at the end of January, uh, essentially by repackaging the deal that Theresa May had negotiated, the so-called withdrawal agreement. But alongside that withdrawal agreement, there's something called the political declaration, which sets out what the terms should be for the future relationship between the EU uh, and the UK. So as a reminder, the withdrawal agreement was kind of tying up the loose ends as a consequence of the UK leaving. Uh, settling the bills, uh, if you like. Um, um, but uh, the political declaration was setting out what the terms would be for the two sides negotiating a future relationship uh, from after the end of January when the UK left the EU. And that's the phase that we're in at the moment. Uh, and that's what the, the, the British government uh, has been uh, embarked on um, and is seeking to reach uh, a deal before the end of, uh, end of this year. But between January uh, and the end of this year, uh, and this is moving on to my, my third point, we have a, a period called uh, transition. And transition is an odd arrangement because the UK uh, has formally left the EU, left its decision-making institutions, and crucially for foreign security and defense policy is not involved in the EU's deliberations uh, on foreign policy and security or on those uh, uh, defense operations uh, overseas uh, and has entered this period of transition where it's supposed to align itself with EU positions in all, of, in, in all respects, but particularly on foreign policy for our purposes, um, but uh, is, is not a member of the EU. And that ends at the end of this year, the end of this calendar year, uh, and uh, the UK, um, those obligations drop away. And the idea being that by the end of this year, by the end of the transition period, you'd have new arrangements in place that would govern uh, the future relationship. And the transition period is kind of interesting because it sort of puts the UK in this odd zombie type condition. You know, it's a privileged partner for the EU in the sense that it's in, bound by the common foreign security policy, as I already said, outside the decision-making structures. Um, and in exceptional cases, it's supposed to be able to opt out uh, of uh, common foreign uh, and security policy. Um, on the common security and defense policy bits, um, all those operations in third countries, it no longer provides commanders or head of operations for, doesn't provide an operational headquarters, which it was uh, for the EU for, for uh, operate an operation off the, the coast of Somalia. The UK withdrew itself from these uh, EU battle groups, which the sort of readiness force is about 1,500 strong. Uh, and outside something called political, um, the, uh, the PESCO uh, process, permanent structured cooperation, which I'll, I'll come back to uh, uh, in a moment. And the idea was that this transition process was one in which you'd have an agreement negotiated out for the future relationship and foreign security uh, policy. So this would be a kind of holding pattern uh, for the UK uh, bridging process, if you like, uh, that would see the UK not moving uh, way too much from the EU's positions, um, but at the same time recognizing the fact that the UK wasn't a member. Uh, and the UK had accepted this uh, as part of the, the withdrawal agreement uh, process. But what we've seen um, in transition is obviously COVID, the COVID pandemic has, has sort of overlaid everything that's happened really uh, since, uh, since the spring. Um, but it, it's really a, pro, a period in which we've been seeing a bit of recalibration in the relationship between the EU and the UK because the UK has become a third country uh, to the EU. 
Um, uh, and uh, for that reason, the EU treats the UK as a, as a third country now. But I, th I think it's very striking, uh, and I'll be interested in any comment on this from the audience, that the other member states haven't really yet thought particularly hard about how the UK relates to them uh, in foreign uh, and security policy uh, questions. They've thought quite a lot about the economics, thought quite a lot about the market relationship, um, but they've tended to think much less about what the consequences are for the UK um, being outside the EU foreign policy uh, making uh, uh, setup. And for the UK, the UK has had to sort of pivot or adjust to thinking about its relationships uh, with, with other EU member states, perhaps in ways that hasn't thought about them uh, since it became a member, member state, what the individual bilateral uh, relationships uh, are. And I think until fairly recently, my view, and I think the view of many other commentators, with the UK, even if it was outside the EU, it was going to have quite an interest in uh, EU foreign policy making. It was going to want to negotiate a relationship where even if it couldn't take decisions uh, with other member states, you know, influence those decisions directly, that it could at least be in a position in which it could uh, decision shape. Um, uh, and uh, that would be done, obviously, uh, on a different basis uh, as uh, a non-member state, but still having an interest uh, and still having a willingness uh, to, to seek to influence that policy because um, it was thought to be worthwhile for the UK uh, to do so. Uh, and so, you know, the process just represented graphically here was, you know, we got the Article 50, so-called Article 50 withdrawal agreement. We're in transition now. There is the negotiations uh, ongoing for the new trade deal. Uh, and alongside that, we were going to have a foreign policy, a security and defence policy deal. That would have some kind of provisional implementation arrangement pending full ratification. Uh, and so you'd have this kind of glide path from ceasing to be a member through transition to uh, the new uh, relationship that would have been put in place uh, after, uh, after the end of transition with the new EU-UK uh, uh, deal. And one of the reasons I think why, uh, why the UK uh, has become more skeptical during this uh, transition uh, period is that having taken a look at what the third country relationships are with the EU and the foreign uh, security policy area, it doesn't really see the models fitting particularly well for, for the UK. Uh, and there are different models. I won't go into these in any, in any great detail, but I mean, they kind of break down between those which are quite heavily codified. There's strategic partnership agreements with Canada, Japan, South Korea, and so on that provide for uh, uh, foreign security defense policy cooperation, set out the areas where they, uh, the two sides want to, to cooperate. And then you've got at the other extreme uh, a relationship, which is the Norway one, where uh, Norway, although very closely aligned to the EU, for uh, questions of economy, because it's part of the single market um, in the European uh, economic area. Um, it uh, has signed up to all sorts of bits of EU defence cooperation, but doesn't actually have uh, an ability to, to shape EU decision uh, making, even though it's impacted by that. So it has a, a LIT, a light type arrangement, a bit like an American light beer, maybe looks like you have influence, but has little or no effect. And in between, you've got the relationship which the US has, obviously, as a superpower, where it doesn't have a particularly well codified uh, or sort of treaty based um, relationship with the EU, either on trade or on, or on foreign security and defense policy with the EU. Um, but it has quite a high tempo uh, relationship. So the UK has obviously been looking at all of these, thinking about what kind of relationship that it wants, uh, and has decided. Um, along the way that actually some of those offerings are not particularly attractive for the UK. And I'll come back to that point in a moment. Uh, I wanted to get Australia in on a slide, um, but uh, alongside a few other countries here, just to illustrate that you know, the foreign security and defense policy relationship um, with third countries uh, uh, is, is codified to different degrees. As you can see, Norway has the most developed relationship um, uh, in terms of formal agreements, but uh, even Australia has a couple of agreements that allow it to participate in those security and defence policy missions um, in, uh, in third countries. Uh, and so, you know, the question for, for the UK is, you know, how many, how many X's do we want to have in the boxes here? Um, and 
do we want to be more like Norway um, or do we want to be uh, more like uh, the United States uh, and, uh, and why? Now, the complication with all of this, and this takes me uh, to my sort of penultimate uh, point about uh, the, uh, the UK uh, and why it's moved away on foreign policy cooperation, is that in agreeing uh, the withdrawal agreement and agreeing the political declaration, uh, political declaration uh, on what the future relationship uh, should look like or what they should negotiate towards. Within that political declaration, there were a whole series uh, of, uh, par uh, or, or a part of the political declaration that dealt with foreign policy cooperation. So as far as the EU is concerned, when the UK left, uh, the UK signed up to the idea uh, of having a foreign security uh, and defense policy relationship that as the political declaration said was going to be ambitious, was going to be deep, but also a kind of flexible uh, partnership uh, and a relationship that was going to uh, evolve uh, over, over time and embrace both internal security, um, so questions of borders, judicial, criminal cooperation and so on, but also foreign security uh, and defence policy questions. Uh, and, and having institutional arrangements in place that would allow that to happen uh, and with a, a sort of structure to have dialogue, consultation uh, and so on uh, uh, and so on. And then uh, the political declaration went into quite a lot of detail about how that would be structured and organized, particularly on foreign policy, uh, this, the consultation and cooperation arrangements, sanctions, which is a key part of EU foreign policy. Uh, and then we need to detail about how the UK would be aligned with these uh, EU um, uh, security and defense policy uh, missions um, in third countries. Uh, and I can go into the detail uh, in the Q&A, uh, if that's helpful. But also, crucially, that the UK would sign up to uh, a sort of emerging cluster of activity on the part of the EU, which is to build up a, a European defence industry infrastructure uh, and, and procurement uh, capability through the, the European Defence Agency. A new undertaking for the EU, which is called the European Defence Fund, which is a, a part of the EU budget, which is assigned uh, for supporting defense industry uh, cooperation. And to join this process called permanent structured cooperation, which is where member states sign up for uh, projects where they try and build capabilities in common. That might be anything from training, joint training, for example, for, for helicopter pilots, all the way through to, to hiring procurement. And all of this for the purpose of, of realizing an ambition that the EU has um, for um, or what's called strategic uh, autonomy. Uh, and also sharing uh, as part of the, Ga and participating um, in uh, the Galileo uh, satellite uh, program that the EU has. I mean, that's, a, that's an issue again that I could go into some depth because it's an issue of some controversy. But uh, the, point, uh, the point I want to make is that this political declaration into a lot of detail what the British government has done since February of this year is basically to say the political declaration um, isn't as binding maybe as you thought it was to the EU uh, and, and set out uh, a different position in general on its relationship with the EU, but has set out a very different position on foreign security and defense policy and cooperation. So just bear in mind, you know, the withdrawal agreement uh, and the political declaration was agreed to by Boris Johnson as prime minister, but before he got his, his mandate, um, um, uh, rather after he got his mandate um, uh, being, being elected, uh, those were pushed through fairly swiftly. He'd been involved in renegotiating them uh, after he took over from Theresa Bay, but only really on the margins and for the most part uh, for the issue of Northern Ireland. So, you know, the EU thought that they were signed up to, to a, a package, if you like, for negotiation of foreign security policies. And then in February, the British government dropped this paper, um, which set out its position and, 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 and uh, a draft treaty uh, for a comprehensive free trade agreement. Uh, within that, uh, within the sort of accompanying document, um, uh, here was the sort of foreign policy uh, uh, bombshell, if you like. Uh, which is that the British government wasn't seeking to follow through uh, on what was in the political declaration. In other words, as you see from the highlighted bits, uh, that it doesn't think it needs a treaty uh, in this area or treaty-governed relationship, 
and it doesn't think it requires an institutionalized partnership. Uh, and from the EU perspective, uh, they've been pretty puzzled uh, as to, to why that's the case. Uh, and puzzled uh, because uh, at the start of the negotiations, the UK was trying to leverage its foreign security policy expertise uh, into uh, advantage um, in the broader, uh, broader negotiations. But you know, looking at those existing models for third country cooperation, if you dig into the detail of the political declaration, you see that actually the UK wasn't really being offered significantly more uh, than a standard third country, third party type deal. So the UK at this time uh, has decided that it's not an area in which it's seeking uh, an agreement. But absolutely crucially, uh, uh, the UK is really focused on the trade uh, policy uh, aspect or the trade relationship aspect, partly because of reasons of time, but I think I also because of reasons of ideological bent, uh, if you like, that the government uh, isn't necessarily seeking uh, a, this kind of a relationship. Um, and that takes me to my, my last reason why the UK uh, has, has stepped back uh, from uh, foreign security uh, and defence policy negotiations with the EU, uh, which is um, the other stuff that's been going on within British uh, uh, foreign policy. Uh, and, and what you might see as, uh, as a, an attempt to put a lot more flesh on the bones of this idea of, of global Britain. And the slogan Global Britain has been around uh, since just after the referendum in 2016. It's been used as a bit of a, a placeholder uh, for what a, what a post-Brexit foreign policy uh, might look like. But as you've moved in the transition period, you've seen some of this start to come to fruition. One, because the UK can now negotiate trade agreements with third countries. I'm sure people in the audience have a view as to whether the UK can do that successfully, whether it can do as, as well as it would within the EU. But the reality is since transition kicked in, the UK can start to make trade deals with third countries on its own terms. And that's why the negotiations have opened with Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, uh, and the US. Um, but, but also, and this is, this is uh, something which is, which is more recent, I think you're, you've seen through the way in which the UK has approached China, and particularly the sort of wake up call on the part of the UK because of China's actions uh, in Hong Kong, the UK um, has started to uh, have a bit of a, a coalescing, a cross party coalition. Uh, coalescing uh, on uh, on foreign policy usage which are different uh, from uh, from the EU position. In, in, in short, the UK position on, on China uh, is much more strident than that of other member states, but crucially the UK is increasingly reaching outside the EU um, to try uh, and pursue that foreign policy. So two examples, uh, the, the statement um, uh, on, the, uh, on the national security law for Hong Kong. Uh, the, the UK uh, uh, produced a, a joint statement alongside other members uh, of the, the Five Eyes, excluding New Zealand. It didn't do a joint statement uh, with the EU uh, in that area. And the UK has been interested in pushing a bit for this idea of looking uh, to create the, the D10 uh, grouping of democracies, G7 plus Australia, uh, Japan uh, and South Korea to look at ways in which you can uh, construct workarounds for the, the Chinese communications technology that we are uh, reliant on or have been reliant on. You can also see in NATO, the UK has been doubling down in terms of, sort of putting its hand up and volunteering for everything that's come onto NATO's agenda uh, since, uh, since 2016. Um, uh, and uh, a, a, an issue that's worth thinking about in the context of the global Britain idea is that UK had planned to start its integrated security and defence uh, for and crucially foreign policy review um, uh, in the spring of this year. That was postponed because of, of COVID, uh, but that's really intended to sort of provide the the sort of strategic or grand strategic level. Um, facilitation for uh, greater clarity about what the, the new foreign policy direction is. Uh, and, you know, a signifier of that is this recently announced merger of the Foreign Office with, uh, the, uh, with DFID, um, uh, the development operation. Very briefly, um, my, last, uh, my last point, um, which is 
Europe's not going to go away uh, for uh, the UK. The UK, in its European diplomacy, has already been switching gears, as I've already suggested. It's doing quite a lot of venue shopping. It's increasingly doing things with the, uh, the E3, which is, which is France and Germany, uh, where it's cooperated on Iran. Uh, and we're colleagues at Chatham House. We're putting out a paper next week uh, on how we see this cooperation developing. There are other ways in which the UK can influence the EU without necessarily signing up to the EU foreign policy framework through NATO, the G7, and elsewhere. And in some areas, the UK may want to... It's going to have to make choices about bilateral relationships. Uh, and paradoxically, maybe EU Europe is going to occupy more bandwidth than, uh, than it might uh, have thought uh, was going uh, to be the case. Now, the fact that it's taken foreign security policy uh, off the agenda uh, now doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to be there for the future. But the tricky thing for the UK is that particularly on the security and defence policy front, the EU has quite a lot of ambition in this area. Uh, that it has this uh, plan to gain more strategic autonomy. I've already mentioned some of the areas in which it's seeking to deepen defence cooperation on the part of the member states and particularly build European defence technological uh, and industrial uh, base and increasingly the UK I think is going to find itself needing to cooperate with other member states on the internal security uh, questions but um, it's it's had some bad experiences and Galileo is an example the satellite sharing program where the UK was very heavily involved in in R&D uh, but was cut out uh, of that program during the withdrawal agreement negotiations uh, and that left a bit of a, uh, a sour taste uh, in, in London so I think there's a bit of trust rebuilding uh, to go on um, before we get uh, back on track or or if there will be uh, a new track of negotiation so just concluding thoughts that you know the, the wider brexit negotiations have overshadowed discussion in this area um, interesting question is the extent to which uk interests start to be conflictual with the eu in the future they're certainly diverging on china uh, i would suggest but the EU is pretty clunky in the way in which the third country plugs in and it isn't offering the UK uh, any special favours and certainly not in the mandates for negotiations uh, with the UK. And, and we're seeing, I think, quite interestingly for a European state, a sort of a differentiated dis disintegration model. The UK, is, uh, it's not just on the economy uh, or the trading relationship where you're seeing the UK moving away, disintegrating from the EU or disintegrating from the EU. Uh, it's also potentially uh, on the, the foreign policy uh, front. So thank you for listening. Uh, and I hope that, uh, that you managed to get uh, uh, most of that uh, um, through the slides. So thank you. Excellent. Richard, thank you very much for uh, taking us through that um, wide ranging uh, gallop through the issues. Uh, we've got um, questions coming in. I'd just like to kick off with, with one. one. One of the um, benefits, I suppose, that the, the UK thought they always brought to the party was the special relationship, so-called, with the US. And, and Mike Pompeo is, is uh, traveling around the moment. How, how do you think the US are viewing this at the moment? Now, it's a great question because, you know, for the UK, the UK described its, its, its broad approach towards foreign policy as a bridging strategy, you know, it bridged Europe, um, Europe to the US and, and vice versa. And you obviously, you know, one end of the bridge is being demolished, which is the relationship with the EU. Uh, the relationship with the US has been more complicated under the Trump administration. But I think it's interesting that China is the area in which we're seeing, you know, we're, we're seeing in a way a sort of working through of what that future relationship might be. And a lot of pressure has obviously been applied on the UK by the US on, on Huawei. Uh, and so we've had, you know, a flip flop on that uh, on the part of the British, uh, British government to, to see itself much more aligned with the US and others. Uh, and, and of course, like everybody else, you know, the UK is waiting to see what happens in November. And therefore, you know, whether a Biden administration, you know, looks uh, uh, tax more to the EU, shall we say, where President Trump has been more skeptical. And there's been a bit of space that the UK can occupy in between. Or whether the UK is, is more cut out, you know, frankly, uh, because the Biden administration sort of, you know, sees that uh, 
rebuilding relationships with the EU is something that favours. So, so you know, the, the UK is going to be very neurotic in November. I think about where the special relationship uh, might might end up. It's it's you know it's the most it's it's the factor that causes most British diplomats going to meltdown. Uh, I think anxiety about transatlantic relations. Um. Moving on, just uh, you, you mentioned NATO a couple of times, but um, as far as security is concerned, will will NATO now become more important for the UK? Yeah, I think you know, I think it's a good question, and uh, you know, I, I made this point about doubling down, uh, and what we what we have seen is that both in terms of deployments, British forces, uh, and also. Um, the, all of the new NATO initiatives, which are essentially to enhance the readiness of, of NATO forces and to have forces which are, are uh, capable of deploying much swifter. The UK has put itself right in the front of, of all of those uh, projects. The real question for the UK, and I think this is a whole for a lot of other states, is, is COVID and the impact on the defence budget. Because, you know, the UK has teed up a lot of, of pretty expensive um, things just coming on stream, you know, like the carriers, for example. Uh, and the the you know e uh, the f35bs uh, uh, and so on uh, and and we have a, a a big nuclear you know strategic nuclear deterrent uh, modernization program coming up so you know really it's whether the U, how much the uk can afford but i think it would it would almost certainly stop doing other things to make sure it it has an enhanced visible and leading role within nato i mean i think that's going to be a core part uh, of the UK's uh, UK's approach to Europe in the future. You, you'd, you'd mentioned the, the carriers there, and I'm just looking um, to, to, to our own region for a minute and the South China Sea. The, there's been a recent talk of the carrier uh, either uh, performing a freedom of navigation operation voyage or even being based uh, for a stage in Asia at some point. Um, I mean, France also has got um, military capability and aspirations in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, does, it, does it not make more sense to be more aligned and joint than trying to go it alone in, in that type of uh, geopolitical issue? No, I think you're, you're right. And, and you know, it's, I think it's a very good point to bring France in as well, because this is, this is one of the interesting relationships in the, the future of the UK's relationship with Europe, which has impacts elsewhere, because you know, France and Britain have a, uh, a close security and defence policy relationship under the Lancaster House Accords, both in terms of um, uh, basically working to, uh, to have joint uh, uh, sort of rapid reaction forces, but also at the same time nuclear uh, sharing. Uh, and um, for that, you know, that's a relationship to watch, frankly, uh, in terms of how France also tries to keep the UK connected because France has a very schizophrenic approach towards European security and defence policy. Um, that it wants more European security and defence policy. But it's also quite realistic about what can be done on the part of the other member states. So it wants to keep the UK looped in. So it's created something called the, the E2I, the European Intervention Initiative, which is for the UK and other states, NATO and non-NATO, to, to try and build more of a, a sort of strategic culture for, for intervention. So, that's one of the reasons why, you know, the relationship with France and Germany, I think, is an interesting one for the U UK. But, but also, aside from that, is, you know, how the UK then balances what it does in Europe with elsewhere. Uh, and and it's, it is anticipated that, uh, you know, there's going to be an enhancing of the relationship with Japan, for example, which is already becoming a much warmer uh, relationship. And I think the U we're likely to see the UK through the integrated review I think we're likely to see the UK say a, a lot more about how the UK imagines it can make a contribution with others uh, to, to the security of, uh, of the Indo-Pacific region in a way that it hasn't thought about that, uh, I think, probably since the early 70s, uh, frankly. And, uh, and obviously, Australia is you know, partly for technical and other reasons, and not least Five Eyes, uh, is obviously one of those, those partners that the, the UK is really interested in looking at where it can do more. Uh, that's, it's interesting you mentioned five eyes because there's a, there's a question there on that that I was working my way to. Um, it was partly relating to hacking by uh, allegedly Russian and Chinese interests into, into British institutions. Um, it, it is, is Britain's uh, five eyes role 
potentially at stake at all, or is 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 there more you know is there more emphasis on them linking into Five Eyes as opposed then to the the European foreign policy of, of intelligence? Yeah, I think you know th 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 there isn't a, a relationship between European states which is comparable to Five Eyes. You know, in terms of um, uh, the basis on which it operates uh, and, and what's shared. And so Five Eyes is, is very important for the UK. But the interesting question is how Five Eyes uh, sort of breaks out into the diplomatic uh, field, if you like. And, and as I say, that lots of, lots of talk in the UK uh, about you know, Five Eyes uh, cooperation uh, and beyond, you know, this the idea as well, particularly on the technological side and, uh, and the cyber concern uh, side. But, you know, uh, Huawei is obviously uh, the pressure that the U.S. put on on the U.K. and Huawei, uh, which was pretty naked, I have to say. Uh, there was, it was, I don't know about arm twisting, I think it was arm breaking. Uh, it was obviously uh, also done in a way that made clear that um, there were concerns about the U.K.'s vulnerability uh, if it persisted with uh, that kind of relationship with Huawei. So we, I think we can expect that will, uh, the U.K., having already moved on that uh, uh, and you know, started to, to put itself in a position which is much closer to other uh, states uh, in Five Eyes. Um, I think you, that direction of travel is gonna be very, very clear uh, for the UK. And, and I can only think that, you know, the, the sort of thing to watch for the next little way is, is how you start to see more, um, more of a visibility of that grouping of states. Uh, and as I say, to me, it's, it's become a priority for the UK partly because this significant shift of thinking within the UK in a very short space of time on China. That's true. Um, we, we had a, a question on trade promotion, and I think it possibly also ties in a, a bit with what you're saying of the recent merger between the FCO and DFID. But does the UK, like Australia, run its trade promotion through the Foreign Office? And I, I think another question then is, is um, in terms of diplomatic footprint, do they have sufficient boots on the ground or you know, if they're not relying on the European external action service, are they going to have to start opening more missions to achieve their, their outcomes? Yeah, we may maybe start with the, the, the last question first. I think the answer is yes. Uh, and I think, again, you know, one of the, we've, all, we've already, we've got a quite a robust uh, uh, foreign affairs committee now uh, in the House of Commons, which is which has really been banging the drum for a greater spend on diplomacy um, since 2016. Uh, and there's been a bit of a response in increasing the headcount. But one of the reasons for bringing DFID, you know, Department for International Development, into the Foreign Office is, is frankly, to, to have more resources available for, for diplomacy um, in, the, in, the widest, in the widest sense and to look at the spend and where the spend can be made most effective. But that also connects to the point that uh, was in the question about trade policy, that uh, when um, after... Uh, uh, after the Brexit vote, we created you know, a new Department for International Trade because the UK hadn't had uh, you know, a, a standalone trade policy since uh, accession um, uh, to, the, to the EU in 1973. Uh, and, and that uh, has had quite a job of work to do, frankly, in the short term, because it's had to try and roll over all of the existing trade deals, um, because all of those expire. Um, uh, uh, when the UK, at the end of the transition period, um, EU asked third countries to accept them as deals until the end of transition. So just working on the rollover has been tough. Uh, and, and now kind of breaking out into to new uh, trade policy uh, for the UK um, has been a bit of an eye-opener uh, for, for the UK. I mean, not least because other countries are more experienced uh, in, in trade policy. The UK's had to build that expertise in fairly short order. But also, uh, I think that um, in third countries, uh, the UK has been a bit complacent, perhaps, on, on some of the trade promotion uh, activity uh, that it's undertaken uh, uh, in, in the recent past. Not to say there haven't been good missions, there haven't been bad missions, there have been bad missions also in terms of you know, different countries where different people have been more effective. But, but again, through the integrated review, I think it's going to be a very close look at what the role and function uh, of, of UK diplomatic missions is in third countries, whether we've got the personnel set up. We're having a bit of a debate about uh, generalists versus specialists, which is diplomatic services all have uh, from, from time to time. Um, and, and the footprint, I think, is absolutely key because um, 
uh, the UK did walk back from some places um, and, and certainly we've, we've also gone down the route of employing a lot of locally, uh, locally employed staff and whether that's also the right model uh, for the UK, whether we need to be more a spend on, on traditional, uh, traditional diplomatic cadre. The, um, the, the E3 consultation, if, that, if that's the right way to put it, but how, how, how important are those um, negotiations for the, the, you know, the UK's ability to, to influence EU foreign and security policy? Or are, are there other member states that the UK should be trying to strengthen ties with? Yeah, no, the, 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 well, the E3 you know, has its origin in the, in the uh, diplomacy on Iran. Uh, and, uh, and that's where it got going. And then the EU was sort of bolted onto that. Um, uh, and, uh, but the, the E3 were responsible for that. I mean, the E3 have been increasingly looking to cooperate uh, in, a, in a whole range of different areas and different settings in quite an under-institutionalized uh, way. Uh, and that works for all three of them because uh, it's a lot less clunky maybe than working through the EU. EU foreign policy making can be, the, the wheels can grow, can grind quite slowly. Um, but um, it has an advantage because obviously it, it brings together, you know, three large European uh, states uh, who have generally been thought about as, as, as the most uh, influential in, in Western and, and Central, uh, Central Europe. But but each leg of that triangle is different. So the UK-France relationship, as we were discussing earlier on security and defense is, is quite well developed. Um, and that's less well developed between the UK uh, and, uh, and Germany. And essentially the, the E3, I think, provides a very good conduit in the absence of anything uh, else and for the UK to try and have influence on the EU. But there's also been a proposal, uh, President Macron uh, floated this uh, for a European Security Council that might involve the UK uh, and, and other states. But that idea keeps popping up, but hasn't really had much, uh, much of a push behind it. But the question for the UK then is, you know, what other bilateral relationships are, are important? The UK's put quite a lot of effort into the relationship with Poland uh, in recent uh, years. It's, it's been working, um, it's been working in, in to try and essentially try and work out, you know, who would be the most effective partners to have influence. Because the big thing that the UK's lost in leaving the EU is it was a very efficient way of hitting 27 countries at the same time. Uh, and that's the really big loss uh, for, for British uh, diplomacy. And you can't replicate that easily. There's another forum in which you can do it. NATO a bit, UN Security Council a bit, but it, there's nothing that would replicate the EU. But on the EU side, the EU has to think also, you know, the UK is now one of three large European countries, which is outside the EU. So UK, Russia and Turkey, um, are not that they're going to form an alliance any time soon, uh, but, you know, that, that is also a, 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 a restructuring of the international relations of Europe, which I'm not sure other European states have fully digested. And so how you connect with the UK is, is as much an issue for other Europeans, uh, I think, as it is the UK. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, do, do you think the, um, the EU is still uh, riding a bit on the coattails, the fact that the UK is so involved with NATO and the UN, UN Security Council as a, as a member of the P5? Are they, are they able to sit back and think that's going to tie the UK still in? To what they want to yeah, do. And I think, you know, also the UK has been involved in, in building collective common foreign policy with these guys, you know, for, for decades. So, you know, the, you know, if you like, the UK DNA is in a lot of those foreign policy positions already. So the UK is not going to walk away from them. But, you know, we are seeing already, you know, subtle distinction. I mean, the UK now has its own sanctions policy, um, um, has to provide for its own sanctions policy legally. And has done that, and we've we've gone down the route of having more uh, Magnitsky-type uh, sanctions regime, more like the U.S. So maybe we're uh, developing a sort of mid-Atlantic sanctions regime. Um, the the question of the P5 is interesting because you know there uh, traditionally Europe EU states have caucused within uh, within uh, New York, and there is now scope uh, for doing that with other states um, in a way that perhaps. Uh, happened in the past, but the UK was, was using a certain amount of bandwidth, you know, for, for working with other uh, European, uh, other European states. So I think, 
you know, sort of scholars of European foreign policy are probably going to have their hands quite busy looking at the shifts that take place in New York, as well as those that take place uh, uh, with Brussels, uh, actually, because, um, it, you know, it is, a, it is a significant asset for the UK having that position on the UN Security Council, which means that it can't entirely be dismissed, you know, as a, as a country which is entirely on its uppers, uh, which has is, which is been some, sometimes suggested with Brexit. Um, just the, there's, there's a comment just in, in t the size of the U EU in GDP terms. It, it's it's seven or eight times the, the size. Um, you know, it, its decisions are going to be influential on on the UK. Um, is there not the question? Does a need need to continue a closer relationship on foreign policy to ensure there's alignment on issues like Russia and, and sanctions or are they going to be able to go it alone? Yeah, no, I think, you know, Russia's a really good, uh, a really good test case, I think, because, um, you know, I think the question is spot on in terms of this, this uh, disparity in size, particularly of economy. You know, I mean, the UK has in effect become a bit like Canada to the US. You know, it sits alongside its most important trading partner and market but obviously uh, can't necessarily be in the room when the policy making uh, takes place, but is affected by whatever decisions the EU takes, you know, as we've seen this week uh, in, in the EU negotiations over budget and its sort of, you know, COVID recovery plan. And the UK will be in uh, significantly impacted by all of that. But Russia is interesting because, you know, the UK was a, a bit of a back stiffener within the e EU partly because of the experience that we had with the, uh, uh, the Novichok uh, poisoning uh, and so on, but that was on top of already a difficult relationship. And now the Russia report uh, this week, you know, on, on Russian uh, attempts to, to influence UK politics. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the UK sanctions regime on, on Russia now is tougher than the EU one. Um, and so with the UK out of the room, will you start to see a bit of a walk back on Russia? on the part of the EU member states. And that's, so that's one of those instances where there is a gap opening up between the EU and the UK. But for the most part, because of NATO, because of the UK's commitment to multilateralism, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to imagine the EU and the UK um, in, a, in, a, in a position in which they are uh, involved in a sort of competition uh, through influence. To my mind, that's not, that's not the issue. I think it's just gonna be a far more complicated um, relationship, particularly uh, if, as we're seeing, uh, we have a government in the UK which is which is perhaps not as bothered uh, about some forms of cooperation than the British governments were in the past. Well, thank you. Um, we we've tried to get through um, as many questions as we could. Um, we've got a few still pending. That's always a sign of a good talk. We've really probably just got time for for one more in our allotted time. So apologies to those who we haven't been able to cover. Um, but a sort of slight curveball to finish off, I suppose, Richard. How how realistic is global Britain in in the contemporary setting? Well, I mean, I. To my mind, I think it, it should it, it should never we should never use this slogan. I mean, I think it should have been it should have just been Britain, and people should have you know projected their own views as to whether they think Britain's global or not. Um, I, I think that it is very difficult. It's very difficult for a middle power, um, which is which has left a key multilateral organisation within its region, to exercise the same kind of influence in its neighbourhood than it did previously. In the environment behind, beyond that. Is getting, is getting more complicated for Western states. So, you know, wherever the UK is done, it has to be done in partnership or alliance with others. Uh, and frankly, for the UK, a lot depends on what the US position is. You know, a lot of UK foreign policy, uh, the weather is made in Washington. Uh, and, and that I think is gonna to continue to be the case, um, whatever uh, administration we have in office uh, in the autumn. Absolutely. Well, that um, that neatly brings us to to the end. So again, ap apologies for those I, we haven't been able to get the, to the questions of. Maybe we can we can revisit this because I think it's going to keep running and running. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, Richard very much for your time. Um, thank you for introducing us to the concept of flexible Brusselization. I think that was brilliant. Um, but we really appreciate your time and and your insights and. To, to everyone watching, um, thank you again for your support and interest. 
um, please stay safe and well. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Richard, thank you again very much, and we'll, we'll be in thank touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. All. Thank you.